I thank the member and recognize the member from Vancouver Point Grey. Honourable Speaker, uh, every generation has a social contract with the generation before and the generation after. Uh, those at the peak of their earning power have a strong interest in investing in young people so that when they retire, uh, the next generation can access good jobs, pay taxes, and support them in their retirement. But what happens when our government, uh, through neglect or for temporary political advantage, walks away from this informal agreement that the older generation invest in the training and learning of the younger? I discovered on a recent tour of BC's public post-secondary colleges and universities that our province is rapidly abandoning investing in accessible education and training for BC's next generation. And the consequences for every generation in this province are already very grave. My tour started, uh, Mr. Speaker, at Thompson Rivers University during their orientation barbecue on a beautiful September day. As the point of my tour was to speak to BC students, I went down the line of students waiting for hot dogs at the barbecue, trying to find students from British, British Columbia. It took me 15 students in the line, Mr. Speaker, before I found someone who wasn't from out of province, from Alberta or Ontario, or someone who wasn't an international student. I later discovered the reason that BC students weren't the majority in the lineup was quite simple. Education expenses in this province have now reached a peak where BC residents can't even borrow enough money to go to school anymore. The statistics back up my first-hand experience at TRU, as well as the stories I heard from so many students and their parents throughout the tour. BC lends the least of any province in Canada through our student loan program, and it doesn't even offer enough money to students to cover the basic expenses of studying full-time in a general arts program at UBC, their cheapest program, at our highest profile post-secondary school. When professional programs like law and medicine are considered, our student loan program doesn't even come close to covering tuition, let alone living expenses like rent and food. This systemic and ongoing failure of our student loan system is the most likely reason that Statistics Canada will tell you that BC residents are the least likely in Canada to study full-time and the most likely to study part-time. In short, TRU's BC students weren't at the student orientation lunch because they can only afford to go to school part-time. Or, if they're going full-time, they're working two or three part-time jobs to cover the difference between their living expenses and their resources through loans or parents. They don't have time for barbecues. And one must reasonably ask whether they have enough time to study to prepare themselves for class. The situation is even worse for skilled trades. A five-week haul truck driving course at College of the Rockies with what I'm told is virtually guaranteed high-paid employment on graduation doesn't qualify for a student loan at all. Prospective students must find $7,500 and take five weeks off of work to complete the program. Young people who can afford skills training find wait lists of two, three, and even four years before they can start school in the program of their choice, programs like shipbuilding and welding. This government wouldn't know that because the Ministry of Advanced Education doesn't maintain waitlist data. Because BC's young can't afford training or they're languishing on a waitlist, they're sitting at home, unemployed and not in school in record numbers. Just six years ago, BC was second only to Alberta for having the lowest number of 15 to 29 year olds out of work and out of school. Now, we're in last place in Canada among reporting provinces. One in 10 15 to 19 year olds in BC aren't in school or work. The same goes for an astounding 18%, almost one in five 25 to 29 year olds in this province. These young people who can't afford to go to school, or if they can, can't get in due to multi-year wait lists, these young people stand by helpless as 29% of the few new jobs created in BC, less than we lost, the few created go to temporary foreign workers. 29% of new jobs going to temporary foreign workers is almost double the Canadian average of 15%, and the highest percentage of temporary foreign workers in the entire country. These young people watch while, government, while employers tell government again and again they cannot find the skilled workers that they need in British Columbia. Before those employers head to Ireland and England to hire skills trade people with promises of guaranteed employment at good wages. While this government advertises skills training on TV and radio, colleges are shutting down English as a second language training for BC residents, opening spaces for international students exclusively. BC's leading skilled trade institution, BCIT, has announced a multi-million dollar shortfall in their budget for this year, and layoffs surely cannot be far behind 
which will only make the wait list for their programs even longer. If young people in this province are lucky, Mr. Speaker, they'll see one of this government's few new investments in skills training, a $1 million advertising campaign that tells young people they should get a trade so they can get work. Honourable Speaker, they would if they could. Despite lending the least, our province's claim is charging the highest student loan interest rate in the country caused government-held BC student debt to rocket past the $1 billion mark in 2011. And the province adds $100 million to this total each year. The government charges former students 2.5% more in interest than the government pays to borrow the money themselves, generating more and more revenue for government each year as the debt mountain grows, all on the backs of the poorest students that have to borrow the most. Prime plus 2.5% is not just the highest student loan interest rate of any province in Canada. It neatly explains why there is no interest and no urgency in this government to address the student loan mountain. Victoria is addicted to BC student loan interest payments to the tune of more than $30 million a year in revenue. The consequences for residents of BC who, according to the Bank of Montreal, have the highest student debt in Canada, an average, average debt rate that exceeds even the debt of graduates from private American colleges and universities, appear very serious. But our government only surveys graduates and thereby, thereby manages to avoid asking BC residents who drop out of their programs why they are dropping out. And too many students drop out in BC or fail to finish their degree or diploma within seven years. A BC school has ranked last in Canada for four out of the last five years for graduation rate, according to Maclean's magazine. Three of BC's four reporting schools rank in the bottom third for graduation rates. This trend reflects a massive waste of human and financial resources in this province that must be addressed if we hope to make progress for young people. It's not enough to stand up and say that BC spends $5 million a day on our colleges and universities if BC residents can't afford to go to these institutions. It's not enough to say that we're investing more in our universities and colleges than ever before if BC's young people, more than ever before, are out of work and out of school. Something is very wrong in BC that we are failing our next generation. This province must invest the time and energy to fix this problem, or our broken contract with the next generation will cost us for years and years to come. Thank you, Member. <clears throat> Recognize the Member from Abbotsford South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Member Opposite. I'm not entirely clear that our, my friend across the House uh, has the accurate information on this whole matter of the relevance of student ability to pay for school and the likelihood of going to school. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the House should know that the research on this is very, very clear. Uh, whether or not somebody pursues a post-secondary education, whatever kind it might be, has absolutely nothing to do with tuition rates. In fact, the relationship is inverse. Um, what really matters is the placement of educational institutions. What matters is the relevance of the kind of education provided by those institutions. But we should also be reminded of what this government has done with respect to providing those opportunities. For starters, th that investment in post-secondary has been huge. It is, we have undertaken the largest post-secondary expansion in British Columbia history since 2001. We've invested more than $2.4 billion in capital funding on over 1,200 separate projects on BC campuses. We've added, since 2001, 32,000 full-time equivalent seats. We've added over 2,500 new seats for graduate students since 2007. We've more than doubled, since 2001, the number of spaces for medical students. And, and that's been in a very distributed fashion through the North, Vancouver Island, and Okanagan. We've invested $165 million to build a new medical program and facilities at UBC, UVic, UNBC, and UBC Okanagan. In 2012, speaking of Thompson Rivers University, as the member opposite did, we invested $7.4 million for the expansion 
of their old main building, provides state-of-the-art space for the law school. We have invested $423 million in research and using that to leverage another $800 million in funds from elsewhere. We more than doubled since 201 the number of educational spaces for nurses. And why have we done this? Because we understand deeply how important it is to invest in youth. We understand how important it is to have a post-secondary education. That is the single quickest path to the right job, to a good job, and of course it's all great for the economy. We have, as everyone here should know, we have developed a system which is very much pointed towards access for you. It's very much pointed towards relevance. And that is our current regional university system, which evolved out of the university college system. This all came from this government. No wonder students say, 90 plus percent of them say, they are very satisfied with post-secondary education in British Columbia. And that's on a multiplicity of measures. We have, speaking in terms of tuition fees, we have the fourth lowest tuition fees in this country. The fourth lowest tuition fees and the second highest participation rate amongst university students in this country. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We should be proud. We also have provided over $5 million a year in scholarships and another 6.7 in provincial assistance to support students with disabilities. We have invested since 2001 over $3 billion in student loans. And again, we also always want to remember that while that's helpful, at the end of the day, that is not what increases the likelihood and the opportunity for somebody to go to school. The research is absolutely clear on that. Again, what makes a difference is precisely the kind of things this government has done. So Thank you, we're Member. not quitting yet. <clears throat> Thank you, Member. We have lots to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recognize the member from Vancouver Point Grey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite. Uh, the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, has a long and distinguished uh, history in post-secondary education, and I refuse to believe uh, that he has not heard from students and their families the challenge of paying for post-secondary in this province if you come from this province. At UBC, uh, tuition is $4,000. That is the lowest tuition. Uh, residents, $4,000. A meal plan, the light eater meal plan, Mr. Speaker, is $4,000. That those costs alone, $12,000. The maximum loan in BC, $10,880. Now, that doesn't include books or other incidental expenses. We do not lend enough money for students to go to school, period. But I've heard, I heard the member opposite also talk about medicine, how wonderful it is that we've expanded the medicine seats in this province. The medicine tuition at UBC is $16,800. But the loan, the maximum loan, is $10,880. So I'm not sure how the member opposite does the math on this, but it doesn't seem to me that prioritizing these seats for British Columbia residents is the priority of this government. I heard a lot about expansion. We've expanded so much in this post-secondary system. This government loves to build buildings, a building, the Center for Excellence in Agriculture, a building, the Center for Excellence in Traditional Chinese Medicine. Well, what about the programs that are going to go into these buildings? And what about the students who are going to be sitting in those new seats that you've created? Who is in those seats? This government does not distinguish between students from British Columbia, students from Alberta, students from Ontario, where students can access grants, graduate student grants, where they can access undergraduate student grants, where they can get additional loans if they're attending professional programs, none of which, none of which, Mr. Speaker, are available to BC students. And I, I heard the member use the survey that the, this government loves to use. 
which is a BC baccalaureate study. And this is the study of the winners in the education system in BC. This is the study of the people who went to school and finished and graduated. This government does not survey the students who drop out. And, and again, I point out that BC uh, has a very difficult record when it comes to graduation rate compared with other provinces. And it doesn't survey, most importantly, that remarkable statistic that the students who are at home, not working, not in school, 13.8% of the 15 to 29 year olds in that province, those are the people, Mr. Speaker, that this government should be speaking to, to find out how we get them into school. I can tell you with the system that we have set up right now, it is difficult, if not high impossible, for students, even from middle class backgrounds, to attend our fine post-secondary institutions in this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.